All right, uh, AP Chemistry students, this, this I'm actually excited for this chapter here because uh, it should go really quickly, uh, I believe. So this is Unit 11, Entropy, Free Energy, and Equilibrium. Scrolling down here, we can see the different learning objectives we're going to cover. This was done in class, the Thermochemistry Review of Spontaneity and First Law of Thermodynamics, and then we also did some work already in class with, the, uh, with, with this part here, um, sorry, the Enthalpy and, and First Law. The spontaneity is also what we covered in class, but I'll go over this one in this in this presentation. Entropy, we go through definition, changes, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, the third law of thermodynamics, and then Gibbs free energy, looking at when it's at standard and when it's not at standard, um, and how we deal with that in terms of equilibrium. All right. So the learning objective zero on spontaneity goes very, very quickly. It's just a practice of understanding if something happens without outside energy or if extra energy is required for it to happen. For example, you do not spontaneously climb up Mount Everest. Now you would spontaneously fall down Mount Everest. It requires energy to stay on the mountain and continue uh, moving upwards with your balance. So that's a non-spontaneous process where if you just put salt into hot soup, that those are conditions that would provide it with a spontaneous process. Entropy is then a measurement of disorder and the units are in joules per Kelvin. Now, as far as number three goes, we have then whether or not the entropy is increasing, decreasing, or if there's no change. Now, the one that we talked about in class is this, is this boiling liquid. Because if we look at an entropy curve during the phase change, the actual physical boiling happening at that point, um, there's no change in entropy. Now, the changing from a liquid to a gas is. So if this said the vaporization of a liquid then it would definitely be increased. But if you read this as just the specific boiling process, you could make the argument that it is no change. But we're going to say that a phase change occurs, so increase. Phase change here, melting, increase. Liquid freezing, decrease. So this goes from solid to liquid. This goes from liquid to solid. Um, and we can write this down here real quick. The entropy of gases is much, much greater than liquids uh, and is greater than solids. So that's the order of these guys here in terms of their entropy. So we can go through the others. There they are. All right, moving on. The two different laws of thermodynamics. The second law is that the entropy of the universe is increasing, or we could talk about the spontaneous process. And then entropy being, the entropy of the universe being, or increasing in a spontaneous process. The third law is that the entropy of a pure crystalline solid is zero. So this is important in terms of um, the absolute scale. So if we look at, at the values for um, enthalpy, and uh, that's what I'm going to deal with right now, and the other one is entropy. So you're gonna you're gonna see that they're both standard. This one has the the delta in it because this is based on um, a reference scale. I'll call it. Meaning that the zero is somewhat arbitrary. They had to make up a zero point, and from there, all of the values of enthalpy are relative to that zero. Where in entropy all of the values here are based off of an absolute zero. Kind of like how, I could put up here, degrees Celsius is also um, going to be a reference scale, so we always have a change there if we're dealing with formations or something like that. Um, where this is on an absolute scale, just like Kelvin is, and so we don't show, when we have the values in our textbook, we look them up, it's not going to have that delta in front. So there's that. All right, so these guys here, identify them as having the larger standard entropy. Lithium here is going to be larger. The reason is it's a, it's a liquid. 
not a solid. This one's more difficult. This one has dipole, dipole intermolecular forces, where this one has just hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a stronger intermolecular force than dipole-dipole, which means it's going to be more ordered, more organized, lower entropy. All of three of these are exactly the same. All of them have the exact same intermolecular force as their partner, and that is dispersion forces. So we look for molecular mass. The larger the molecular mass is, the larger the polarizability is. The larger the polarizability, the more possible microstates it can be in, and then the more uh, disordered it's going to be. So that, that's how we identify those. All right. Now for these, I am going to do maybe the first one here. Let me get out my answer key. Um, yeah, I have it already done for the first one. So you know what? I'm not going to do the first one. I am going to do... Yes, I am. I lied. I am going to do the first one. Uh, so one of the interesting things here that since the third law of therm thermodynamics is not something that can be achieved at 25 degrees Celsius, because by definition it has to be at zero Kelvin, you're always going to have entropy values for every single thing. So where enthalpy, these would be zero. Entropy, it's not. So we're going to do... Uh, 1 times the entropy of sulfur dioxide, which is 248.5, minus the other side, sulfur, 1 times 205. And these will always be positive values, too, won't they? Because it's on a zero scale. You never get a negative absolute entropy. You get negative change in entropy, 31.88. Uh, oops, and I'll put the times one over here, I guess. So there we have then an overall change in entropy of 11.6 joules per Kelvin. So there's our answer for that one. You do the same thing for the rest. Appendix three is we're going to search for these values, or you can go online and look for um, entropy values at 25 degrees Celsius. Without using um, the Appendix 3, identify if you would have an increase in entropy, a decrease in entropy, or no change, I guess, would be the other option. But we're just, I, I don't, I'm not sure if they would be able to give you an example that there's no change in entropy. So positive or negative, and explain why. So the first one is positive because we're increasing the number of moles of gas. Just as also, we're just increasing the moles of things. Two to three. One, two. Here's one, two, and one here. Three things there. And so that's going to increase entropy. But the fact that one of them is a gas now is going to be um, very significant. Down here as well, we go uh, from gas, which is more disordered, to more ordered. So this is going to be negative. Entropy decreases because gases have larger entropies than liquids. Um, same concept here, just the opposite. We're going from solids and liquids to aqueous and gas. Aqueous are going to be uh, have a larger entropy than liquids and gases are going to have a large entropy than solids. So all of that in here builds the randomness of the system, and so the entropy is increasing. Number four is a little bit more difficult because we have N2 and just 2N, but if we think about it in quantities of gases, one mole of gas, two moles of gas, we can say it's positive because we're going from one to two, and this is going to be negative. We end with one product and start with four of them, also, we start with three gases, which gases matter a whole lot more than solids or liquids. All right, so now we have the second learning objective, which is the Gibbs free energy. And we do work with Gibbs free energy um, standard and then also with equilibrium stuff. And then finally uh, with, um, oh, that's it, I guess. That's all, yeah. Um, so there's two different definitions here we can look at. It's the energy associated with a process that can be used to do work. And uh, if we have a negative value for Gibbs free energy, so delta G of a reaction is equal to negative 
that means that it's going to be negative. Why did I write a one? Is negative. Um, that means that it has energy. It's giving off energy that can be used to do work. Another way we can say is the measure of spontaneity. So if something is a negative, that means that it's spontaneous. If something is positive, it is not spontaneous, meaning it requires additional um, energy to be able to occur. And then if it's zero, that means it is at equilibrium. So another thing we can say about the non-spontaneous, it's actually spontaneous in the reverse direction. So if we just flip the reaction, so if we had A goes to B as the delta G of positive something, that means that it's not spontaneous, but if we then flip it, B to A, the delta G of that reaction would be spontaneous. And really I should be doing this. And there we have it. All right, so there's good information about delta G, gives free energy. And now we can do some calculations. Uh, so number nine, I am going to do number three and only three of these. All of them are the same process, but number three is has more in it than others. So I decided to do that as the example. So we have uh, the delta G of the reaction is equal to, and I'm going to start doing some brackets. We have four times carbon dioxide, which is negative 394.4. If you're looking these up on a table, and on the online and you're finding that the values are slightly different than the values that I'm using that is okay oftentimes there is some um, error factor or even some disagreement over what the exact values are but they should be close guy is zero, so I don't need that guy. So this is going to be the um, settling, I think is what that is. All right, so we go through and just do our simple calculations. Delta G for this reaction is equal to negative 2470 kilojoules. That's all I got to do with these. Oops. Erase. Um, number 10, we looked at in class, at least the year uh, that we did, that I made these videos, we looked at in class. So let's see, let's just go over these anyway. Um, we're looking for two different things. Whether or not the reaction would be spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius. And then if it isn't, at what temperature would it become spontaneous? So we looked at this kind of a grid here in class. I'm going to draw it up again. Over here, we're going to have delta H. Over here, we're going to have delta S. We have negative, positive, positive, negative. So um, we have four different situations that can occur. If we have a negative and a positive, negative enthalpy and a positive entropy, both of those things are working towards spontaneous. So this is uh, spontaneous at all temperatures. Now if we go down to this quadrant down here, if we have a positive, which is endothermic, and negative, which is more ordered, both of these processes are working against um, it being spontaneous. So this is not spontaneous at any temperature. And we can actually do this mathematically if we look at the delta G equation. That's a different equation. So 
So if we plug in negative for um, the enthalpy, and plug in positive for the entropy, this value will be negative no matter what the temperature is. If we go to the other side, positive and positive, this is only going to be spontaneous at high temperatures. So again, we can plug it in. Um, at th This is working against the spontaneity of the process. So if this is a, a value that we can increase because of increase in temperatures, we'll eventually subtract a large enough number making delta G positive, and then this one is going to be spontaneous at low temperatures. It's the opposite. So in this case, we have delta G is equal to 10.5 minus 298 times 0 0.003. That's one too many zeros. So the delta G is equal to 1.56. So at 25 degrees Celsius, this reaction is not spontaneous. So what, what temperature is it going to be spontaneous at? First of all, let's look at the two different uh, signs here to see if we can use the quadrant to figure out if it's ever going to be spontaneous. In this case, we have a positive, positive scenario, positive, positive, which means that it's going to be spontaneous at high temperatures. So we have to figure out what temperature we're going to increase this to to get it to be spontaneous. So zero in for delta G, plug in values, 10.5 again, minus that temperature we're going to solve for, and then we have times 0 0.03. So zero is going to be at equilibrium. So when we solve for temperature, which comes out to 350 Kelvin, what, so any temperature above 350 Kelvin will be spontaneous. And so that is the threshold level. Above that is at which it will be spontaneous. At 350 or lower, it will not be spontaneous. At 350, it is at equilibrium. All right. Number two, uh, going through the process, delta G gets us 35.5 kilojoules. And um, because we have a positive and a negative, a positive enthalpy and a negative entropy, both of those things are working against spontane spontaneity positive and negative, no matter what temperature you uh, you try to solve for here, it will not work. I think the temperature you actually get is like negative 16 Kelvin. It's not possible to have a negative 16 Kelvin. So it's regardless if it's above 16 or below 16, it's just not going to not gonna work. So, um, so we can say never for the second part. All right. A lot of these are the same. Um, I'm not going to find the temperature here. Uh, actually, sure I will. Yeah, why not? Okay, so number one. This one's this one's an easy one because we have a negative enthalpy and a positive entropy, which means both of those things are working towards spontaneity. So this is just going to be spontaneous at all temperatures. Don't have to do any work for this to figure it out. It's going to be spontaneous. Um, here we have a scenario we have two negatives though, and so we'll end up with a spontaneous, so it'll be spontaneous at low temperature. So we're going to do the same thing. Zero equals negative one one point seven minus the temperature what we're solving for times 0 0.105. Keep track of those units. The temperature comes out to be 111 Kelvin, which means that any temperature less than 111 Kelvin is going to be spontaneous. All right, now we can look at um, the equilibrium 
constant as well as gives free energy. So I guess I started to answer this question and never did. Explain the difference between delta G and delta G uh, with the degree sign. And this one is standard state. This one is not simple enough. So standard state, as a reminder, is going to be uh, one atmosphere of pressure. It's going to be one molar for the concentration if it's aqueous. It's also going to be at 25 degrees Celsius. Now there's some fudge room on this one. Like when we solve for delta G standard stuff using delta H uh, minus T delta S, notice that these values here are standard. Standard. because of the little degree symbol. And how this one is too, this one also says it's standard. But when you throw in the temperature, that kind of makes it not standard anymore because we're no longer at 25 degrees Celsius. So 25 degrees Celsius is for these two guys but not so much delta G. The reason why we call delta G standard is because we're using the standard enthalpies for the other two parts of the equation. And it turns out that the temperature does not affect the standard, ent standard enthalpy or standard entropy very much, but it does impact this gives free energy. So we, we sort of fudge a little bit with that 25 degrees Celsius when we're solving for that delta Q. All right. Now, how do we use that same equation to figure out a relationship between delta G and K? So we have this one right here. Oh. Delta G. Standard is equal to, uh, let's see negative R T natural log of K. That brings us over here. We can talk a little bit about that. So if delta G is a negative value, that means that the K is going to be larger than one, which means it's going to favor the products. So we see that we can use delta G the same way we use uh, um, the equilibrium constant. So if we go back the other way, where delta G is a positive value, that means the K is going to be less than one, and this is gonna favor the reactants. Now if we have delta G is equal to zero, it means that K is equal to one. And that means that this thing is at equilibrium. It doesn't favor either side. So this is, this is that relationship that we use. So we can plug stuff in to that. So 2.6 for the Gibbs free energy equals negative 0 0.008314. Remember that R is 8.314 anytime we're dealing with um, joules. And so then we can take that times the temperature, 298, times the natural log of K. Do our algebra and algebra 2 stuff. K comes out to be 0.0018. There it is. 80. Is that right? That can't be right. Oh, point three. that's better. 0 0.35. Our value for that. Now we can kind of go backwards here. Instead of dealing with um, uh, Gibbs free energy to solve for an equilibrium constant, we're given the equilibrium constant to solve for delta G. Now, it doesn't say here what temperature it's at, but the Kw of water 
when it's 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th, that is actually at 25 degrees Celsius. So I'm not sure if that was a mistake in the problem or they just wanted you to assume, make the jump that it was 25 degrees Celsius from this. So we have delta G is what we're looking for. And that's going to equal, again, negative 0 0.008. 314298 natural log 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14th. And we end up with a value of delta G equals 80 kilojoules per mole. 80 kilojoules. There's the value there. Simple stuff. 15 is going to be the same thing, and so I'm going to skip that. 16 is not the same thing um, because we're not actually given a K value. So this is a two-step problem. When you look at these, you're like, it seems like there's information that I should have that I'm not given because when we look at that equation, delta G is equal to negative RT natural log of k. It's asking me to solve for two variables. That's not possible. And so we need to go somewhere else to figure out what one of those variables is. Now, um, the I'm not sure if you could, you could probably look up this reaction and find it somewhere. What the question wants you to do since we've been practicing this so far is to go to appendix 3 and look up the delta g values and calculate it for this. So the delta G of this reaction is equal to zero. So that one's zero, that one's zero. Just like enthalpies, these guys have zeros in their most stable form at 25 degrees Celsius, so diatomics. Minus, and then we got our water, two times negative 228.6. That means that the delta G of this reaction is going to be a positive value, close to 500, 457.2 kilojoules. Now we can figure out the other problem, which is solving for K. So let's do that. We have 457.2 is equal to negative 0 0.008314 times 298 natural log of k. Get your algebra skills on and we end up with an equilibrium constant of 7.2 times 10 to the negative 81st. So let's go back and review our answers. First of all, the delta G is a positive value which means that it's not spontaneous. And it's spontaneous in the other direction and that means that the KP is extremely small value, which means that the equilibrium, or sorry, this thing will proceed from right to left. This one up here, we could also say since it's not spontaneous, we could say spontaneous in the reverse reaction. So we have those two things. And then we'll go back to the actual reaction itself and see if that makes sense. And do we ever see water all by itself splitting up into hydrogen atoms, hydrogen molecules? And oxygen molecules. It doesn't seem like that happens by itself. Not a spontaneous process that I'm familiar with and so my answers match what the problem asked. Last problem guys. This one is, is kind of messy. It's kind of screwy and this is why. Look look at that spot right there. It's asking for the enthalpy or excuse me the Gibbs free energy of the formation of this. Remember that the formation value is uh, would be this copper plus oxygen, those are both gaseous, it is COCl2, and then we would have to balance this thing, oh, I forgot chlorine over here, Cl2, that means that I have to have one half of that. So that, that's, the, and that's the, the formation reaction. So we're looking for this value and then we subtract those values from these values. That's how we would normally do it. But we don't have this information available to us. 
So we're gonna use this instead. The first thing that we're gonna do is solve for the Gibbs free energy of the reaction. Because once we have the Gibbs free energy of the reaction, we can go down here to the next step and say, well, the Gibbs free energy of the reaction is equal to the sum of the Gibbs free energy of the products minus the sum of the Gibbs free energy of the reactants. So once I have this, I can plug these things in. Also requires some work from Appendix 3. So all in all, this question is pretty frustrating because it, it is making the assumption that you know that you should look something up, which how, how do you know that you're supposed to look something up, right? Um, what, what happens on quizzes or on assessments, things like that, you'll be given those values directly. Uh, a better question here, again, I don't write these, these come from the textbook. A better question here would be using the, using the equilibrium constant and appendix three, calculate the delta G affirmation. My guess then is that this right here is not on that table, which is why you can't just go to the table and look it up. All right, so a lot of weird stuff for that one. Going back to this, the delta G of the reaction. Try that one more time. It's going to equal at 0 0.08314 again times 298 natural log of 5.62 times 10 to the 35th. That's a large, large value for uh, K. That means that this is going to equal negative 204 kilojoules. So I need that for this. So we have, oops, I should put that in the right spot. Hold on. We need that for this. Okay. <clears throat> Negative 204 is equal to the products, which is what we're searching for, delta G of the product brackets. Minus, then we have these two pieces. This isn't gonna have a Gibbs free energy because it's diatomic in its most stable form at 25 degrees Celsius. This one is gonna have one, so we have one times negative 137.3. Go through and rewrite and solve the delta G of that product, which I'm gonna say COCL2. You know what? I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna do Gibbs free energy of the formation of, which is the same thing as that, is going to equal negative 341 point. Oh, that's it kilojoules per mole. There you go, guys. There are some more difficult questions on here that I did not cover. And uh, one of the things, one of the equations that you get is this one. Delta G not standard is equal to delta G standard plus RT natural log of K. And so um, that is, oop, hold on, there's something wrong here. Natural log of Q. This one is useful in determining um, whether or not something is at equilibrium and which way it would shift to reach equilibrium. So we know that um, it's, it's not going to be at a place where we can solve for uh, standard stuff, but we can solve for it not standard. 
and then we have the, the quotient products over the reactants. And then uh, maybe uh, we'll do some of those in class. All right. Good job, everybody.